What's up everybody and welcome back. If you are new to our channel, be sure to subscribe so you're notified whenever we post new videos. In this video, we're gonna break down one of the most important components of rock climbing performance, that is contact strength. In the last three videos, we've discussed the specific adaptations we should expect from a finger strength training program the multiple methods used for testing and training the fingers off the wall, and most importantly, how to get those adaptations to transfer better to grabbing holds on the climbing wall. As a quick recap, these adaptations include improved muscular recruitment, hypertrophy, and stiffness of the connective tissues. These allow athletes to have more quality climbing practice. I'd consider it a qualitative and quantitative benefit to a climber's hand and forearm. It is not because we ever need to produce that much force while on the climbing wall. At the end of our last video, I suggested that strength precedes power. So to get more powerful, we have to get stronger first. Yuri Verkashansky posed this idea in the 60s, which still rings true today. This concept is valid for a few primary reasons. Reason number one, the connective tissue stiffness acquired with strength training allows the tendon to shorten at the speed of the muscle. And reason number two, gaining access to high threshold motor units, which are naturally fast twitch. These adaptations should increase an athlete's potential for being more powerful through their hands. The best way to understand fast twitch fibers is to contrast them with slow twitch fibers. When we climb at a lower intensity, the movements are slower and less forceful. Because of this, the duration of the activity can be sustained longer. That's mostly a slow twitch fiber stress. Those fibers use a different energy system with a much greater capacity. Conversely, the fast twitch fibers are the ones we activate with heavy strength training or high power output movements. When we climb at our highest intensity, the movements are faster and more forceful. Because of this, the duration of the activity is reduced significantly. This type of work uses an energy system with a much lower capacity. So in order to tolerate a mix of things, our bodies constantly cycle between different fibers depending on the duration and the intensity of the task. Additionally, the mixture of each fiber type in a muscle depends on the muscle group and the individual's genetics. But all muscles in the body have some variation of fiber types. Regarding the hand and forearm, a small amount of research has demonstrated that the extrinsic finger flexors and extensors have fewer overall fast twitch fibers than the intrinsic muscles of the hand. This means that the lumbricals and the interossei muscles are underappreciated in developing contact strength. This research theorizes that the interossei and lumbrical muscles must move faster because they flex the MCP joint first, which is optimal for subsequent finger joint flexion when grabbing objects. So this provides additional support for training the talon grip, which more intentionally targets the interossei and lumbrical muscles but we'll cover more of that in the following video. It is well understood that the most direct method of increasing recruitment to high threshold motor units is progressively overloading a stable strength training movement. This happens by generating a large central motor command in the brain, essentially an electrical threshold, to activate these fibers. But there's a limit to how much of a stimulus the brain creates and reduces with fatigue in the set and the session. Training those fibers to be activated with an external load on a hangboard, lifting something off the ground, or pulling against the scale is simple, and there are multiple methods and examples in the first two videos. The problem is that activating these fibers alone does not guarantee improved sports performance. That's because the movements used to train them, the strength training stuff, are too slow and controlled. The activation and coordination gained are at the movement's velocity, which is less likely to increase contact strength. As discussed in the first video and what other climbing research demonstrates, reaching peak force in the finger flexors happens within one to two seconds when using a strand gauge. It's likely similar to how long it takes someone to lift their feet off the ground with a heavy fingerboarding load. And it's likely apparent to everyone watching this video that grabbing a hard hold at your limit does not allow that same time frame. It needs to be performed much faster. We currently don't have data on the rate of force needed to grab holds while on a climbing wall. If we use metrics from other athletic movements and sports, 
the difference in rate of force and velocity between a strength training movement and a sporting movement is vast. If we compare the velocity of a back squat one repetition max with a vertical jump, the difference in the jump's velocity is around five times faster than the back squat. This means that heavy back squatting will increase force production and total strength, but will not guarantee an increase in reaction time or jump height. That is, until the athlete trains that movement pattern at or slightly above the intended velocity of the sport. But remember, this has to happen at a reduced intensity because the load always governs the velocity of the movement. So once we've gained access to these high threshold motor units in the hands, fingers, and forearms, we need to shift our attention to increasing their force development rate and eccentric stretch tolerance. The good news is that this should be easy in its methodology. We already do it frequently on the climbing wall with limit level bouldering moves. The intention is to move quickly, be as coordinated and efficient as possible, and end each set and session with a power loss. The biggest limiter is having the volume be too high. We must be cautious with the volume when power training because of the coordination loss experienced with fatigue in the large motor units. Remember, they don't have the same fatigue resistance as the slow or intermediate twitch fibers, so we can't push it as long during the session. A coordination loss to the hands and fingers can increase injury risk, but will undoubtedly limit the highest performance adaptations. If you're watching this video, you've likely experienced this before. At some point in your limit or red point climbing sessions, you can no longer perform those difficult hand moves with control, speed, and efficiency. That represents a power loss to the hands and fingers. A coordination loss to the high threshold motor units happens because the metabolites accumulated reduce shortening velocity first. In that scenario, the fibers literally cannot contract quickly any longer. As mentioned already, climbing research has yet to rigorously measure the rate of force needed to grab various holds while on the climbing wall. I've seen one video produced by our friends at Lattice Climbing which provides an excellent baseline for a better understanding of load through the feet and hands while on the wall. I will continue to study this for future videos once I get my fixed digital rung shipped over the pond. Their video was designed to demonstrate that climbers use different techniques, amounts of pressure through their hands and feet, and momentum to influence the efficiency of different climbing movements. Their focus wasn't on the force development rate, but we can see from their small data sample that the peak forces going through both hands on the starting hold were at their highest 47 to 51 kilograms or 103 to 112 pounds respectively. These athletes both weighed around 73 kilograms or 160 pounds. This puts the highest force on the hands and feet at around 67% of the athlete's body weight. If we eyeball the force rates on the catching holds they are moving to, we see that they only hit over 30 kilograms or 66 pounds of force in the most powerful test. The other tests were right around that same force in a short time frame. Only in that most powerful test did either athlete get close to 50% body weight. The typical catching hand in this small example is approximately 40% body weight. A handful of research papers studying the rate of force in climbers start with the athlete hanging at body weight on a 23 millimeter edge with various grip types. They have the athlete in a harness with a strain gauge fixed below them to resist upward motion. They have the athlete pull to 90 degrees at the elbow while the cord becomes tight, have the athletes hang for one seconds, tear the device, then have them pull hard and fast as possible. This allows measurement of peak force, rate of force, and average force over time. One of these papers found that in elite athletes, they produced around 108 pounds of force within 200 milliseconds. In another paper using the same testing position, the numbers are slightly higher in the 84 to 128 pounds of force. The higher force rates were primarily bouldering athletes compared to sport climbers. When I test my 200 millisecond pull numbers on a 20 millimeter edge from a different position, the numbers are a little different. This could be because the testing position, but also because the sampling frequency of the Tindec progressor, which is 80 Hz. Both of these other papers used a sampling frequency of 200 Hz. Other papers have used strain gauge fixed over the head with one arm. 
allowing the athlete to contract hard and fast with no initial starting force. This more accurately represents the rate of force development as we'd use it on the climbing wall. That being said, because the time frame between powerful hand moves can be fast, there's never a total relaxation of the muscles. The sweet spot is likely somewhere between the two, so we need to use devices attached to the climbing wall to better understand what's going on. This paper used a 100 Hz strain gauge and multiple grip types, showing that climbers produced approximately 42 to 62 pounds of force per hand in 200 milliseconds. So their findings might demonstrate that athletes are producing around 84 to 124 pounds of force with the two arms in 200 millisecond time frame. Indeed, I'm extrapolating here to gain a bigger picture about the numbers we do have on the force rates of a climber's hand and fingers, but there are some consistencies. What's interesting is when I measure my high rate force in isolation with one arm on a 25 millimeter edge, I also produce around 65 pounds of force per hand in 200 milliseconds. Again, the sampling frequency and test differ but there's no doubt that the ability to produce force within that time frame is meaningful for climbing performance. Both my numbers and the one and two arms divided by two research numbers track with the forces seen on the catching hand of the lattice climbing video during the power move. The research paper's conclusions on metrics that matter for contact strength suggest that athletes performing at higher levels can produce more force in that short time frame. As discussed, the research shows that power output is essential for higher sports performance and strongly correlates with increases in maximal finger strength. However, because of our limited data, the power requirements, the force development rates, and the best contact strength training practices for climbing are not even close to being settled. To improve contact strength, an athlete must train to produce more force in that short time frame or apply the same amount of force in a shorter time frame. In our next follow-up video, we will summarize current non-climbing methodologies used to increase power and contact strength. Undoubtedly, powerful climbing movements are the best source of this adaptation. But what about the campus board, pull-ups on the fingers, and high-rate loading with the Tindike Progressor? I will argue that most power training interventions performed off the wall must be lighter, and faster to improve power and contact strength. Once again, thanks for your attention and for watching the entire video. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. As a thank you for watching this entire video, I'm offering another 15% discount on any of my new client consultation services. If you're a climber with a pain complaint or looking for more targeted education and programming, use the code POWER at my website store. I'm only offering five of these, so grab one quick. Thanks again. See you in the next video.